Hello and happy Friday day after Halloween, everyone. I don't know if you're like me um, or maybe like my kids and you're still in your pajamas, but um, we had a great Halloween yesterday at Reactive and um, now um, it's Facebook Live Friday. And today we are talking all about ataxia treatment. And the reason we're diving into uh, ataxia for the next few weeks is because we have a mini course coming up on next Thursday, November 7th. And this mini course will really dive into application of some of the things that we talked about last week is in terms of theory and understanding of the cerebellum and really applying them to cases. I think that is where I learn the most. A lot of us learn the best is through application and how this works on an, an individual basis with people. Um, I forgot to introduce myself, but I'm Julie Hirschberg. I'm the owner of Reactive Physical Therapy and Wellness. We're here in Los Angeles with two clinics providing um, occupational therapy, physical therapy, yoga therapy, exercise for people with neurologic disorders. And um, if you're new, uh, welcome. And one of the things that we do a lot of is movement disorders. So we have a fellowship program for people, for physical therapists to train them more in depth in movement disorders and ataxia actually falls under that realm. And it is another one of those disorders that is a little more rare, not well researched, not well understood from a PT standpoint. It can be very challenging to treat and find lasting gains and this can can be, I know from personal experience, it can be very frustrating uh, for physical therapy. Therapy. Therapists. Oh my goodness, I might have had too much candy last night. Um, but um, as I mentioned last week, right after the brain stem, the cerebellum is my uh, second favorite part of the brain. And I think um, this is why a taxi is so fascinating to me. Uh, last week, we talked about the really cool structure of the cerebellum and how it's ripe for neuroplasticity. And I think one of the challenges is finding those right treatment approach that are going to capitalize on that. So that's what we're going to touch on just briefly today. We'll do a little sneak peek into the current literature for the treatment of ataxia. Uh, talk about how you might actually structure a treatment session um, in for somebody with ataxia, and then give you a little preview of our course that's coming up next week. So I want to start with some of the literature. And um, just like many of the other disorders that we talk about here, the status of the literature, the quality of evidence is kind of dismal, to be honest. Uh, there's not huge randomized controlled trials. Um, also, ataxia itself is better, very heterogeneous. There's different causes. It could be from stroke or brain injury, or it could be a hereditary disorder. So it's really difficult to study. And routinely systematic reviews of the literature come up with poor levels of evidence. And we often have to turn to really small studies and case studies to inform us in our practice. And I actually was, as I perused the literature here, there was a recent systematic review, and this was in children. And I, I thought this was an important one to talk about. This was from Hartley and colleagues in 2019 called Exercise and Physical Therapy Interventions for Children with, an ata with Ataxia. It's a, it's a systematic review. And um, there are a couple of interesting pieces, I think, from the systematic review that I found interesting and I think informative for us and not surprising, as I said, with other um, studies, it basically said there's inconclusive evidence support therapy in this population. And uh, they said that inconclusive evidence, but it, it like PT is the like the main course of treatment for kids with ataxia and adults. So this, by the way, this is a study in kids, but I think it also really applies um, to adults. If anything, there's actually even less literature in, um, in kids. Um, 
So one of the things that we see in the studies is very small sample sizes, better, very heterogeneous in terms of the, the type of ataxia, even the interventions um, were, were, um, were very different and the outcome measures as well. So no firm conclusions could really be made and there's a need for research. And I, we hear this over and over again in more rare diseases. Um, one of the, the pieces that um, I found interesting, and I think this is a growing area of rehab in general, is that there is a lot of technology coming out. And some of the more recent studies um, with young kids with ataxia were looking at video games and things as simple as using the Wii Fit, the Xbox Connect. Um, and they found some promising results for improving balance and coordination. And I find this particular um, summary really informative because when we think about carryover from what we do in person to taking it home, uh, this particular study cited another study that they said only about 9% of children's, children with Friedrich's ataxia were able to carry out their home exercise program at the, as it was directed. And this is a challenge, not for just for kids, but really for everybody. For, for myself, it's hard to carry over a home exercise program. And I think the use of technology, I mean, who else? I don't have one yet, but I have a lot of co colleagues and friends who have the Peloton bike. So, I mean, a lot of people like having technology to, um, to improve their ability to exercise and do things at home. So they found this, um, some of these studies um, here for kids, and I think it's something to really think about how we can use that to help people carry out the practice at home, especially when we know with um, cerebellar disorders that um, the motor learning may not be as effective as in other disorders and might take more repetition. So um, that, again, was just a couple little take-home pieces from that Hartley systematic review of ataxia. Now, I'm not going to give away everything. Actually, Chelsea and Lauren have reviewed a lot of the literature in um, ataxia and will do so in the course that uh, we have coming up next week. Um, but I wanted to just give you one more little, little piece and little preview. Um, by the way, if you're looking to really um, dive into some of this literature, if you follow the work of Amy Bastian's group uh, from John Hopkins, it's a really, there's so many great studies coming out of that group. That's like the first place I dove into things. Um, and there is another article um, also from 2019 from that group where they were looking specifically at uh, adding weight to reaching movements in people uh, with ataxia. And um, I think this is very common method that physical therapists will use for ataxia. Even if you go on um, some patient discussion boards, using weights on the limbs is a common discussion piece. And it, it's been used forever in ataxia. Um, but this study really looked at what, what does that do to the movement? Does it actually change it? And they looked at both single joint and then multi-joint movements. And overall, what they found in this study is that there was an immediate benefit of weighting the limb on the single joint. So just looking at elbow movement. So this also was um, not like a full therapy rehab trial. This was really um, an isolated looking at the, the specific immediate effect on reaching. So just a single joint, so elbow flexion, for example, immediate benefit of that. And they actually found that benefit for people who were either hypometric, like undershooting, or hypermetric, overshooting. And uh, this was a little sidebar, by the way, 
the idea is that the waiting would actually help the person with hypometria more than someone with hypermetria. So hypometria meaning undershooting, the addition of the weight um, was hypothesized to help them more, but actually found it beneficial for both for a single joint movement. When it came to multi-joint movements, which are frankly, most of our functional movements, right? When it came to multi-joint movements, this was not the case. So they actually found that it stayed the same or got worse, and nobody really got better with a um, with weight for a multi-joint reaching movement. So I, I find this very interesting. So I know I have had people come to me who have um, who have added weights themselves because it's been beneficial, um, or they're walking with weights on their limb. Um, and in our mini course, we're gonna talk also about weighting the torso and what the evidence is there and what is some of the clinical expertise there. And so I think clinically, I've seen it many different ways ways. And this was the first study that I found to look at it specifically to see the benefit within one movement and an immediate um, change. And here they found benefit for single joint and not for multi-joint movement. So I think this is a piece that we need to consider when um, providing weights to, to people um, and seeing what changes for them. So uh, definitely something I'm going to be thinking about. Um, so those were just a couple of little pieces, very recent literature from this year in terms of ataxia. And uh, we're gonna be talking a lot more about it on uh, next Thursday as well when we dive into cases. But one other thing that I wanted to talk about today is just some general ideas of how a treatment session might be structured. And um, I actually saw one of my uh, former clients this week. Um, she was coming in to work with somebody else and she is somebody who has ataxia from a very large stroke. And what that means is she also has weakness and sensory loss. She has some contractures that have developed, but it really was the ataxia that was most limiting her transfers and gates. And when I think about um, her intervention, I almost think about this pie chart. And we've talked about the pie chart a lot, and maybe that's why it keeps coming up. Um, either that or it's pumpkin pie season. I keep thinking about pies. But um, when I think of what um, what we need to think about for ataxia, um, we think about some of those underlying physical limitations, especially if it's gone on for a while, what else is going on that might be compensatory? Or in, in the case of my patient, she had contractures. So she had some physical limitations to, to address. So that's one part of the pie. And that was actually a big part of the pie. Clearly she's having um, the ataxia itself, especially in her trunk and overshooting things, which was really limiting her functional mobility. So we wanted to work on that control of her trunk and movement. So again, I'm kind of doing like a piece of the pie, right? So we have her physical limitations, we have her control of movement, we have her functional mobility, so it was impairing her transfers and gait, and we know um, from the literature in ataxia that we might need more repetitions there. So we can't just do like two transfers in a session. We need to do multiple repetitions and in different directions and to her wheelchair and to the mat and to, um, to different chairs that she um, might be going to uh, during the day. Um, and then we want to think about equipment. So for her, walking with the standard walker or cane just wasn't going to work. She didn't have control um, of her upper extremities. So we had to really get creative and try different pieces of equipment. And so those are kind of the pieces of a whole treatment session. So for example, we would work on mobilizing her ankles and um, stretching her calves so she could get her 
feet flat on the floor. Um, so addressing those physical limitations. We would also work specifically on her trunk control through movements in sitting and taking that into a transfer and practice repeatedly. And then put that also into gait, that trunk control. She actually wore um, a balance-based torso weighting vest um, that helped her considerably with walking. And we tried um, an upright walker with her, which was ultimately what really worked, but then had to really work on a lot of repetition and practice for her so that she could then um, take that home and, and do it with her family. So that's just one example of how you might set up a treatment session for somebody with a taxi and taking in to account some of the the literature and ideas that we've talked about um, finally what we were going to talk about is just a little preview of our of our weekend course so I want to talk to you about what is it's not a weekend course I'm sorry my head um the dog started barking and I totally got distracted there there's my dual tasking uh, abilities for you but uh, our mini course next week so we're um going to talk about an overview in the pathophysiology of ataxia talk about the cerebellum's contribution to motor control and motor learning we've hinted a lot at that um in these Facebook lives Talk about assessment. So we haven't talked about this at all, but there are some good assessment tools for measuring ataxia, and then you can really look at your outcomes. Describing the research as well as clinical expertise for treatment techniques to address ataxia and the effects on function. Utilize some really great cases, really good cases. And what I love about the cases that Chelsea and Lauren have put together is like, these are not simple cases. These are people that are really quite involved. And so I think it's really nice to have those examples. Sometimes those are the examples that are missed. Um, and discuss those clinical questions and challenges that come up with treatment. This is something that might need more physical therapy, might need a longer term plan. How do we make decisions about that? So uh, those are the stuff, those, these are things that we talk about in the clinic all of the time. And um, I think this is uh, going to be a really great discussion for physical therapists who, um, who work with people with ataxia. So, so there you have it for our Facebook Live Friday today. Uh, we talked a little bit about some of the recent research, just, just briefly. Um, we talked about how you might set up a treatment session, considering all of the pieces, including things like equipment, um, and give you a preview of what's to come in our mini course. So our mini course is next Thursday. Um, we would love to have you there live. We actually have just about one more spot if you want to be with us in person at our clinic, which is always very fun. We have a potluck beforehand and then then do the uh, course together, but you can also join live online and it's recorded. If you can't make it online or it's super late because we do it at 6.30 in the evening Pacific time, which is not great if you're on the East Coast, uh, but we have it recorded and it's um, just over 90 minutes usually um, because we get in a lot of good case discussion that usually takes us over the mark a little bit um, to the like 105 minute mark. But uh, we'd love to have you join us and thanks so much for joining me on a Friday and have a great weekend.